chosen to put the scriptures with the verses because of time. But I do want you to take the opportunity to either write them down or go back and get the CD or DVD or to listen to it on the web so that you can go over these verses for yourself. This is a, I'm, I'm sort of teach preaching this morning, so we're going to be on a somewhat marathon. Now, if you have questions, do me a favor. Go on and just, at your leisure, write them down uh, because we'll try to address those as they come up. But right now, I've got a fast pace I'm trying to keep. If you're looking at Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1, Go back and get the other sermons. Can't do much review. The Bible says, and I saw when the lamb did what? Now recall we're talking about the seals that are on a book that is in the right hand of God that only the lamb was qualified to take it. But he's also qualified to not only take it, but also to open it. Those were the, that was what was in the hand of God on the throne as John wept because he didn't see anyone able, qualified, and then he was given the encouraging news, you can dry your tears because somebody broke through. And he identifies him as the Lion of Judah. He identifies him as being the Root of David. And he identifies him as the Lamb of God. If you don't know who that is after all of that description, I will not just assume you don't want to know, I'll just tell you, He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He and he alone was worthy to take this book. And this book, don't think of it as a codex or a Bible as you currently have. In that day, it would have been scrolls, still called a biblion or book, rolled up, either made out of papyrus, from which we get our word paper, or from skins, rolled up on both ends. And John said when he saw it, he said all of these seals knowing that somehow the promises of God, the will of God and the eternal ages are all tied up in that book that cannot be opened until the seals are removed. In the book is redemption of both the body, there is recoverance to the earth, there's removal of the curse, there's fulfillment of prophecies, there's the plan of the ages as well as the promised judgments of God. All that God desires to do in eternity is contained inside of that scroll, but he can't move, won't move, until one qualified can take that book and open it. In Revelation chapter 5 and verse 8, when the one who was qualified showed up, verse, six, verse 8 uh, says, uh, and when he had taken the book, and that person, he was the lamb. It says, the four beasts and four and twenty elders, they fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vows full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. In verse 9, they ascribed to him worth, because they said, you are worthy, thou are worthy to take the book. They ascribed to him great deeds, because he says in verse 10, you, talking about the Lamb, you have made unto us kings, unto our God, kings and priests, and will reign. And then you see this innumerable multitude in verse 11 of 10,000 times, 10,000 and thousands of thousands, innumerable in number, saying with a loud voice, worthy is who? The Lamb, the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature, every creature, every creature, he says, which is in heaven and on the earth and on, under the earth, such as are in the sea, every creature, brother whale, brother camel, uh, brother, brother hound dog, everybody are going to say blessings and honor and glory and power be unto him, watch this, watch the word, the, unto him that sits on the throne and it's to both. He's saying what we're ascribing to one, we're also ascribing to the person on the other side of the and, and the and is the lamb. And he said how long? Forever and ever. Now he has the book 
and Revelation 6, which has not yet taken place, verse 1, John foresees what is going to happen in the future when he begins to remove the seals. He has the book. Now it is simply a matter of opening the seals. And he tells John as he begins to open them, there's a thunderous sound, and he said, John, I want you to come and see. Come see for yourself. Now, the open of the seal begins unstoppable events that are described by the prophets. Look in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Now, I put the verses up here for you today. I think I did, or they did. Did they? <laughs> All right. There we go. So, for time, I'm going to permit you just to look at the board, but don't you get used to this because I want you used to looking at your Bibles. Uh, in Daniel 12 and 1, it's an unstoppable prophesied event. These are the words of the prophets. The Bible says, And at that time Michael shall stand up the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. Now watch this. And there shall be a time of what? Trouble. Such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book of life. Keep in mind there shall be a time of trouble such as there never was. Never has been a time like this. In Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7, Jeremiah says, Alas, for that great, for that day is great. He's talking about a period of time. So that that, that none it is like it. Even, it is even the time of Jacob's trouble. A particular emphasis upon Jacob, the nation of Israel. And because they would not accept their Messiah when he came the first time, there is a punishment handed out to the children of Israel uniquely. He came to his own, and his own received him not. And they even said, we'll not have this man rule over us. They even said, his blood be on us and on our children. They didn't know what they were asking for. But they're going to get what they asked for, which is trouble. But there's hope. Not all Israel is going to be punished and destroyed. He said, there's some going to be saved. Joel chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. The Bible says, blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh. Watch the description. It's a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong people that have never been ever the like, neither shall there be any more after that, even to the years of many generations. Meaning what is coming, there has never, of all that has transpired in the world, there's never been a time like this time. The words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 and verse 8. And as he said upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? The end of the world. They wanted to know, how is the world going to end? When are, you, when are you coming? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Here's what he says the future holds. And you shall hear wars. And what? Rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation. And kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, pestilence, earthquakes, and in diverse places... And then I have this underlined, all of these are the beginning of sorrows. Just the beginning of it. When the Lamb opens this book, this 
particular prophesied time frame is going to start. It is called the Great Tribulation. It is called the time of Jacob's trouble. Daniel would call it, this is the 70th week, that last week before God's plan is fulfilled. Go back with me in Revelation chapter 6. Because the prophecies tells you the general idea of what's coming. Revelation is going to give you some general and specific details of what all is included in this day. Anybody reading this ought to run. Anybody hearing this ought to run. If you came in here lost, and if you go out the same way you came in, you haven't heard what God wanted you to hear. And I trust and pray you won't look on me. Think of what he says in his word. He opens the first seal. Come and see. Seal number one. He said there's a white horse. Put my chart back up. You're supposed to work with me, camera people. Come on now. We got to work this out. I tried, I got Brother Walter to do some artwork for me. I'm trying to get my son to work with me here. Between the two of them, we're going to get through this. <laughs> We're picturing this time as, I'm going to call it the seventh week. You can call it the great tribulation, the time of trouble. You're talking semantics. It's the same thing. It has a beginning when the rapture takes place. The church is out of here because the church has not been appointed to wrath. And I, and I don't want to get sidetracked on talking about what's going to happen to the church when we meet him in the air. That's another time. The focus in Revelation is what is going to be happening to the world and on this earth during this period of time. And as the Lord uh, opens that first seal, and this is how it plays out in Revelation. I'm giving you a big picture. There are seven seals to be opened. And then after he opens the seventh seal, which is right here, that leads to seven trumpets. And then after the seven trumpets, there's going to be seven vows. And inside of each and every one of these is specific details that he wants us to know about what's going to take place in that time. All I can tell you is after reading it, you don't want to be here. He opens up the first one, which is called the seal with the white horse. And then he follows in succession. We're going to walk through this chart as we look at seal one. Revelation chapter six, verse two. And I saw and behold a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him and he went forth to conquer and to conquer. Now don't com confuse this white horse with the Revelation 19 rider. Two different riders. The one in Revelation 19 is coming victoriously. The one here in Revelation 2 is going out to conquer the world and basically he's going to try to do it through a means of peacefulness. This is what we believe is coming someday, that there's going to be one probably who will rise up and say, I have solutions to the world's problems. And through his subtleties and through his ways, he's probably going to bring an element of peace. Probably can handle the terrorist situation. Probably going to handle the Middle East situation. It's going to be a peace that is called a false peace. As a matter of fact, Thessalonians says when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction because it's going to be a peace that will be false this person is going to present himself as a conqueror a messiah an antichrist who basically has this world's best interests at heart but then he'll turn and then he'll show his true character that's the first rider then he says I saw the second rider the red horse he says in verse 3, seal 1, white, seal 2, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. He said, there went out another horse that was red, and power was given unto him to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. This is wars, those rumors of wars, that warfare that will go on before nations. And as you can think about all the wars that have transpired on the earth, 
they will be nothing to compare to the turmoil that will be between people in the time to come. The question is, is the world going to grow towards peace? No, nope. it's actually headed towards war. And it's going to be nations against nation and people killing each other with swords, putting each other to death through violence. Number five, verse five, third seal. Number three, he has a, a rider who's on a black horse and he has a pair of balances in his hand, scales, weighing out the produce and the cost. And he says, I heard a voice in the midst of the beast say, a measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of wheat for barley and a penny, and see thou hurt not the wine and oil. Those numerical numbers tells me that things will be scarce. Produce will be scarce. And it's going to get to where the cost of it is going to be out of bounds. When I was a kid, I'm not old, I'm from the country. Gas was 19.9. We never thought we'd see anything above 30 cents. 19.9. Now, it's all right if you got the money to pay for it. But what do you do when you don't have the money to pay for it? And I, I might not be able to buy gas. The problem is going to be when you don't have the resources to buy food. Now we've watched pictures of famine in many parts of the world. And I've never seen a picture that I'm not touched, not just emotionally, but to try to do something if possible by some children that are starving or people with big bellies. It hurts to see this. But that's localized. He's talking about on a worldwide basis. That's what he's talking about. Verse 7. Rider number 4. And when he had opened the fourth seal, he sees a, a pale horse. And he says, come and see. And the one riding this one is called Death. Hell followed with it. And power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth. So if you take the world's population, he says that this one is going to affect one-fourth of the world, that they're going to affect them through the sword, violence, and with hunger, with death, and as I'm looking at the last part of verse 8, animal uh, uh, consumption of humans will increase. It will increase. The beast will be involved. I heard a lady say, you know, you ought to stay out of the ocean because it belongs to the sharks. <laughs> and they'll eat. And you ought to stay out of the woods because they belong to animals. Meaning that the nature of beasts probably multiplied is going to create a lot of deaths. Then he gets to the fifth seal. That's this one. And he says he saw something different. We talk about the four horsemen, but now we're through with the horsemen because now he's going to talk about some intricate details as he opens these seals. And when he had opened the fifth seal, he saw under the altar the souls of them that were what? And for the testimony, which brings you to a question. If, chart up please, I'm going to raise my hand up on him is what I'll do. Rapture takes place. Witnesses and saints are caught up. Who's going to be on this earth to tell people the truth? But there's going to be people here telling folks the truth. But watch this. People who are here on earth after the rapture, he calls them mortars. Meaning they're probably going to lose their lives just as the first century church went through a great time of persecution. But the church is gone now. Now every believer on the earth after this is going to also have to almost go to the mat in death in a testimony that they are in fact a believer in Christ Jesus. Now let me throw something at you, but it's not what I want to see. I believe that when the rapture takes place, one of the strongest testimonies to the gospel will be the rapture. The strongest. Because you have to explain 
Millions and billions of people miss it. And graves that are vacant. You have to explain that. Now, if you're here today and you heard this message and you've not accepted Christ, when the rapture takes place, your mind is going to say like these, it was true after all. Now, I'm okay with the idea of people, well, I'm not. People say that if you hear the gospel now and don't get saved, you can't be saved in the tribulation. I don't find that anywhere in scripture. I believe probably the first people that will be saved will be those that were said I should have been, but I wasn't. Now you say I got a second chance. Yes, but what you have to go through. What you're going to have to endure is not going to be a picnic. Right. I, I give this at the end of the sermon, but I'm going to throw it in here right now. I'm glad I got saved on this side of the rapture. Amen. I'll, I'll talk about that later. So you have this testimony of the seal knowing that there are going to be people dying during this period of time. For what reason? That they're believers. They're not going to receive the mark of the beast. They're not going to take his number or his name. They're not going to worship him, and there's going to be great trouble. And then verse 10, they cry for vengeance and justice because they, they, they want to know, Lord, we've, we, they, they've done wrong against you and your servants. How long? He said, I need you to wait a while. Now, verse 11, and I believe this group, watch me now, I believe this group is going to be martyred in this first part that first part because he says in verse 11 he said I need you should rest a little season until your fellow servants also and their brethren should be killed as they were killed should be fulfilled meaning there's more coming at this end because there's going to be believers all the way through here but I repeat it's going to cost you something to be on this earth and name the name of Christ. Verse 12, seal number six. We have the riders, four horsemen. We have the seal concerning the mortars. And then seal number six, he says, I beheld and opened, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a what? And the sun became black, a sackcloth of hair, and the moon became blood. And the stars of heaven fell upon the earth as of a fig tree cast of her untimely figs when she's shaken of a mighty wind. And the heavens departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. Keep reading. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bond man and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. We used to sing a song, where are you going to run? Where are you going to hide? Now, the running and hiding, all of this stuff up here is bad. But they're not running from this. Verse 16 says, they're going to say to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us, not from the wars and the famines and pestilence and all of that. They're asking to be hid from one person. Do you see it? They said, hide us from the face of him. And I can only put it this way. There won't be no bad people on this day. What I mean by that, toughies. There won't be nobody snapping their finger at God saying, I can handle it, bring it on. No, nobody will exist on this day snuffing or making light of God. There won't be anybody making jokes or humor or comedy about God. There won't be anybody cussing with his name on this day because this day is the day they're all trying to run and hide from the face of him on the throne because this is the time all that bad talk you got, this is when you got to pay for it. This is that day.
For the great day of the wrath, his wrath has come. Who shall be able to what? You have six seals that have been opened. There is a seventh seal, but the seventh seal does not open until Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1. You see it when it opened, the seventh seal? But in between what you read in chapter 6 and chapter 8, there's an interlude, there's data that is given to us to say, hey, listen, all of this is going on, but let me tell you another story. And the story concerns two groups in chapter 7. Group number one, God said, I don't want you to hurt the earth, hold back everything, don't touch nothing yet, don't hurt the water, don't hurt the sea, don't hurt land until I do one thing. I got somebody I need to seal. That word seal means I need to let them know I am theirs and they are mine on the ship. The sealing also says I'm providing them with divine protection so that this group will not be hurt or harmed by what I bring. They won't be killed by what I bring to the earth or from the Antichrist who will fight against them. I'm going to protect them. And then notice who is this group, this first group. Verse 4, he says, I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed a hundred and what? Now you've lived long enough in your community that the people have asked you if you're part of the 144,000. <laughs> now, I hurt, and I have to tell you that I hurt because next to, close to where I live is a watchtower group. And every time I drive by there, and they come by my home, and I, I entertain them at the door, and I, I'm not one of those that tell them go away. I, I ask them a question. Listen, you have something you believe you want to share with me, right? Yes. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to give you 20 minutes to tell me everything you want to say, and then give me 20 minutes to tell everything I want to say. And I promise you I won't interrupt you, and I don't want you to interrupt me. So for 20 minutes, I'll just listen. Then I tell them, your time's up. And then 20 minutes, I don't do nothing but read scripture. And I have yet to have one stay at the door for 20 minutes. <laughs> because when they want to argue, I say, no, we agree, or you're a person or your word, that we're just going to share. Now, you go meditate on what I give you, and I'm going to meditate on what you, I give you, but they never stay. And usually I use this because as they walk away saying they don't want to hear I usually ask them, you claim you came to my door with truth. I give you the Bible and you run. So why are you running from the Bible? Now, that's my witness to people because I do believe they need to be testified to. Now, don't get into arguments about Christmas and, and, and pledging and all of that stuff and birthdays. That's not where I go. I read every verse I have underlined in my Bible about Jesus. I don't talk about all that other stuff because it doesn't matter. See, the problem is if you're not straightened out with him, you got problems. Now watch this. Who is this group? He says there in, 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 in Revelation chapter 7 in this interlude, he says there are 144,000, watch this, of all the what? 144,000, I can understand that. They're from the tribes of Israel. That's not spiritual. And the reason I know that is because now he shows you the details. 12,000 from this one, 12,000 from this one, 12,000 from that one. He walks now. Now, first of all, the group at your door probably is not Jewish. They're not from the tribe of Israel, and if they could, they can't trace it. <laughs> the second thing they are all sealed which means they have God's special protection of God from all divine judgments from the antichrist so that they could perform their mission during the tribulation period later on you'll find this 144,000 no matter what comes at them from antichrist he can't kill them and the person at your door can die from a car accident They're redeemed. Look over in Revelation chapter 14. These are people that have been redeemed. And they 
they sang, verse 3, they sang as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders and no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. They're redeemed. And if you're going to be redeemed, you can only be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. Notice some other things about them. Uh, they're going to, uh, the, these are those that are not defiled themselves with women. So that means if it's not a woman, all 144,000 of them must be. Amen. Now, the other thing is, they're all virgins. That wipes out every, every Jehovah Witness that I know. <laughs> because these are the specifics concerning this group. Now, who I think this group is, is what it says. 144,000 Israelites, 12,000 from each tribe, been sealed by God to go and be a witness to the world during this period of time. Put me back. During this period of time, they're going to go out and be a flaming witness to the Lord. But it's going to cost them something. They're going to suffer, but they can't be killed. I can't find anything to tell me whether they are or not. But I'd like to think that this 144,000 have a prototype in the Apostle Paul. Could be bitten by a serpent and not die. Protect it. And if I if he's if he if there ain't gonna be anything like him, just imagine what will happen on this earth when you get a hundred and forty four thousand potential witnesses. Potential on the earth like the Apostle Paul going everywhere. And if, if, if this is that group, then the world, in spite of all the seals' judgment that God is bringing, I want you to understand he's still showing mercy and grace. Even during that time, God is making a way for those who want to be spared from what's coming. Someone says, God is mean. He's telling you what's coming, and he's trying to redeem you before you get there. You say, he's harsh. Well, he's already told you I'm going to judge you. Now, if you accept that he's God and he's going to judge, get right. Before that time comes, be on the right side of the team is what you want to be on. And so we have this group of people that are there. By the way, we are gone. So I'm not worried about being one of the 144,000. I'm gone. That's the last group I want to be in is 144. Because that means you're here doing the tribulation. Go back to Revelation with me. Chapter 6. Are you with me, church? Amen. There's a second group in this interlude. And that group is found in verse 9. And I think it is because of the first group that we get the second group. Because he says, And after this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the lamb and before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and they cried with a loud voice saying salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb what you ascribe to God you have to ascribe to the lamb John 5 says, if you're going to honor the Father, you have to honor the Son. He says, and all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts uh, and fell down before the throne on their faces and worshiped God. In verse 13, one of the elders asked the question to John. So where do these come from that are arrayed in white robes? And when do they come from it? John said, sir, you know, when you don't know something, fess up. He said, I don't know. And he said to me, watch this. These are they which have come out of what? Meaning that this is a group. Come back with me, Mr. Cameraman. This is the group that is going to witness during this period of time. And a multitude of people are going to be spared from the wrath of God, which is what he's trying to do. Because he loves his creation. He loves sinners. He doesn't love sin. 
but he's a just judge and he's going to do what he promised that he will do. And so this group has come out of the tribulation. They washed their robes, made them white. And that's the only way you can be washed. The only way you can be washed on this side of the rapture is through the blood. The only way to be washed on the other side of the rapture was the blood. As a matter of fact, there's nothing that can wash away your sins. <laughs> Talk to me, church, but the blood. You said, well, what about the Old Testament? Without the shedding of blood. In the Old Testament, they gave an animal looking forward to the real lamb that was to come. What we do is we accept the sacrifice of the lamb that has already come. And even those in the tribulation are going to be looking back to that sacrifice of the, the lamb who shed his only blood. And then notice that's an interlude. And then we pick up with that seventh seal. Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, we're impressed about it because he says there's silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God and to them were given what? Sound like we're getting ready to loop this thing again. Because we start out with these seven seals. And now out of that seventh seal it opens up seven angels holding seven trumpets. And now they're getting ready to blow. Now, before they blow, there's another interlude, meaning data that's put in between the introduction and the performance of what these trumpets and angels do. And verse 3, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came up with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of, he, out, of the, out, out of the angel's hands. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and it cast it into the earth. And there were voices, thunders, and lightnings, and earthquakes. I want to talk about prayer for a moment. Because he's talking about what the saints now and then I should be doing is praying. I'm going to talk to you about prayer. This is praying time. You say, well, hi, I, I, Lord, I'm struggling. Talk to me. Amen. Someone give me a hard time. Talk to me. Amen. Lord, you told me if I do this, talk to him. And by, and by the way, God does not promise you that if you do what he says, you won't have no rain on your head. Amen. You talk to me. Lord, I'm up. Uh, Paul said, Lord, uh, uh, I got a problem here. With, he, take it away. Take it away. He said, no, I'm not going to take it. But he talked to me. What I'm saying is, tell him all about your troubles now. And my prayer, and it should have been my prayer, and should be your prayer, is that as I'm thinking about what is coming, my prayer is these words, thy kingdom come. Come on, God. Let's get this thing over with. And this is when he says, prayers answered. We're praying for deliverance. Now someone said they want a breakthrough. I'm not worried about a breakthrough on earth. You might break through tomorrow, might be underneath the next day and need another breakthrough. I'm not talking about on earth. I'm talking about up yonder. And so we're praying, Lord, how long? When? Uh, God, help me. When you're doing what he says, you have a right to pray to him. But the prayer ought to be the answer to all this world's troubles. You know what will handle San, uh, uh, San Bernardino? Thy kingdom come. That's what will handle it. At least for us. Because it means no more of this. And that's when we go on home to glory. And this world can go through what it goes through. But we need to be praying for this to come forward. Revelation chapter 8 and verse 6. These angels just getting ready to toot. Seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Now watch it very quickly. 
first angel sounded, there was hell, fire, mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees were burned up, and all green grass, gone. Verse 8, you read it. And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the earth, and the third part of the sea became blood. I did a little scratching because I wanted to know uh, what is this mountain and it doesn't seem to come from heaven. It seems to be something that is already on earth. My mind immediately went to volcanic activity. May or may not be. There is a volcano. The largest volcano in the world is in Hawaii. And it, it gives the dimension that it is over 2,000 miles square. And if it blows they're not sure what it is going to do to the, uh, the Pacific oceans and things of that nature. But watch this. They have never, now found that the largest volcano is on a mountain under the water. And it is over 12,000 miles square. Just been discovered. They call it, it's named after, um, uh, it's called T Texas AMU, TAMU. It's what it's called, Texas, Texas A.M.N. University, TAMU. And the people who discovered it says it is a volcano that if it blows, if the lava and magma in it comes up from that ocean, the consequences are going to be astronomical to all sea life, including the ships that are on them. Watch this. Verse 9. And the third part of the creatures which were in all the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were what? That's trumpet number two. Trumpet number three. Third angel sound. And there fell a great star from heaven. This seems to mean more meteorite in its origin. Burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers. Probably disintegrates over the uh, coming in and upon the fountains of the waters, and it's going to affect the fresh water supply. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, meaning bitter. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded. And the third part of the sun was what? Smitten. And the third part of the moon, the third part of the stars, so that the third part of them was darkened, and the day, sh day shone not for a third part, and the night likewise. I have done a lot of reading trying to understand this, and I still don't. One suggestion, and I kind of go along with it, is that the only way you can have all three of these things occur, where the sun, the moon, and the stars are all affected by a third, is that you have to speed up the rotation of the earth. Meaning less light, less sun, less moon. Possible earth rotation. You know, God got us tilted just the way, right way we're moving at the right speed. But he could change this. Okay. And then verse 13. That's for the angels that have sounded. And I beheld a low an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice. Three times. Whoa, whoa, whoa to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpets of the three angels which are yet sounding. Meaning it's been bad. But these next three are the three that are worse than the four that have gone previously. And then you get another interlude with chapter 9. Because in chapter 9, not an interlude, but you get an explanation of what he means. Chapter 9 and verse 1, you get the fifth angel. I want you to go through this and read it on your own time. Because there's to be someone opening up the bottomless pit. And then he says when he opened it up, there rose a smoke out of the pit, verse 2. As a smoke of the great furnace, something is coming up. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit, verse 3. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. God has used physical locusts in the past. But this particular group seems to defy natural descriptions of locusts. 
because these are going to go forth. They're not going to eat anything green. Okay. But verse 5 says, it was given them at least that they should not kill man, but that they should be tormented. Man is going to be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Verse 6 says men are going to seek death in that day and not find it. Desire to die and death shall flee for them. And then he gives you descriptions of these locusts, uh, horses and uh, he, uh, on their heads were crowns and faces like the face of man. And we're trying to picture that. Whatever he's describing is not natural to what we know to be natural. And I'm more inclined to believe that he's trying to give us a picture of demonic forces let loose. Our world is in trouble. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to hit you with something. Demonic activity has always been there. But what he is telling us, we haven't seen anything yet. I think it's demons that in, influence people to do a lot of things in this world. Demons, demonic activity. It's demons that help people commit violence. It is demons that possess people. By the way, you shouldn't do drugs or alcohol, listen to me, of any kind. You say, why? Because drug use, the word there is pharmakias, pharmakias. The word there is sorcery or witchcraft. You say, well, what about alcohol? That's spirits. Because every time you drink, your spirit changes. You're not the same person. And you're allowing yourself to be influenced in other ways. That is why Christians should abstain from anything that's going to make us act crazier than we already are. Amen? We don't need no help. We need all the sanity we can get. Amen? That's why the scripture said be sober minded. <laughs> We need all the help we could get. But there is to be a demonic activity. It will increase. And if we are seeing it today, I think it is demons listening, working in this world, confusing people even to their gender. <laughs> Starting early to influence them. Very early. So there's an unnatural releasing of demonic forces and if we have seen or witnesses to demonic activity today, I'd hate to think what it's going to be like in that day. Look if you would, verse 13. Revelation 9, 1 through 12 is about the unnatural demonic forces. Verse 12, Revelation 9, 12 says that's one woe. Because the demons will now have free recourse to pretty much do what they want to do, unchallenged. No restraint. No restraint. No restrainer. No hold back. Because while the Holy Spirit is present, his restraining ministry, as he wants restraint, has been altered. One woe. But he says there's two more woes. Out of these seven trumpets, these last three get a war piece. He says in verse 6, and the sixth angel sounded. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is, said, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpets, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed and were prepared for a day, uh, not, I'm sorry, an hour, a day, a month, and a year, meaning that they have a fixed period of time, one year, one month, one day, and one hour to do their work. And their work is going to be to what? Slay what? <laughs> now if you've lost a fourth of the planet early, and I believe this is in the latter part of that three and a half years, he now says you're going to lose a third of the world's population. I don't care what you say, those are high numbers. You're talking about big numbers. You're talking about billions of people that will be slain, and it is going to be through this particular group. Now, Verse 16 says, and the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. That's a 200 million strong army. And there's a lot of speculation about who can mass that kind of army. 
and you could attribute to this nation or that nation. I'm saying while we may not know what nation or what group of nations can do this, there will be a 200 man army who will basically be marching around the world doing nothing but bringing death and destruction. There are some things about them in verses 17 through 8, 19 that let you also know whoever this army is, they're inspired by someone or something behind them that is also not natural. In that first group uh, with the locusts, they can't kill anybody. They can hurt them, they can sting them and cause them pain. In the second group, they bring death. Something demonic in all of this. And then lastly, they're going to kill, verse 18, a third of men by the fire and by the smoke, meaning this death is going to be worldwide. And then verse 20, interesting. You would think with all of this happening on earth and people seeing it, somebody would get right. <laughs> You'd think that people would get right. Kind of reminds you of Egypt, doesn't it? All that God did in Egypt, Pharaoh and the people kept just hardening themselves, hardening themselves. Someone said, if God do something, I believe. But I, I need you to understand, people saw Jesus do miracles. Still didn't believe. Hardening themselves. Verse 20, we're in shock. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor their sorcerers, sorceries, nor of their fornications, and nor of their tales, meaning business kept on going as usual. Sin had a grip and they didn't care about it. It's amazing how strong the sin nature can grip us. And then notice, as we close on this part, there's a, another uh, trumpet to sound. But that trumpet does not sound until you get to Revelation uh, chapter, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 10. So you have the, 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 the six trumpets. You have the three woes. The seventh trumpet is going to sound soon. But before that trumpet sounds, there's another interlude. I think I'm going to have to stop and pick you up next week because it's going to take too long. There's an interlude again. You'll see in verse uh, uh, Revelation 11, 14, the second war is past. Behold, the third war cometh quickly. And verse 15 says, and the seventh angel sounded. But before that happens, there's an interlude. And the interlude is chapter 11 up until that point. And it concerns two that are prophets. Now let me help you today. We don't have prophets today. I'm going to help you. As a matter of fact, you don't need prophets today. You have everything you need to know from God already given you. If a prophet jumps up and says, I got a new word, he can't add nothing to this book. Or she, and they cannot take anything away. But in this day, we're going to get prophets, and watch this, their prophetic office is going to be validated because they're going to do some things. There are two. Oh, and you can study this book all day long and try to figure out who are these two witnesses. Verse 3 of Revelation 11 says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. Basically, three and a half years. We're trying to figure, is that the first half or the last half? He says, And these are the, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And all kind of discussion about who they are. Is it, is it Enoch? Because you know he didn't die. Or is it Elijah? Because he went up in the whirlwind. Or, 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 or is it Elijah and Moses? Because both of them were standing on the Mount of Transfiguration. Here's what you're going to have to do with this. He doesn't tell you who they are. And by the way, you don't want to be down here when they're here anyway. <laughs> Amen? Amen? So this is one of those, you don't know who they are, but they are. And watch what verse 5. They're going to do certain things. It is for judgment, yes, 
But through judgment, God is trying to get the attention of the observers. This uniquely is what is going to happen in the city of Jerusalem. It says, and if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. If any man would hurt them, he must in manner be killed. Kind of reminds me of a prophet in the Old Testament when they went to go get him, and he says, well, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven. <laughs> Boom, they were gone. Verse 6 says, they have power to shut heaven. That sounds like Elijah. Let it rain not in the days of their prophecy. They have power over water to turn it to blood. That sounds like Moses. But it don't have to be either one of these. Whoever these prophets are, they will be able to do these things. They're going to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. They're going to keep doing series just like Egypt over and over and over. Flies and lice and frogs and pestilence. And you would think the whole nation should have said let's get right. But they didn't do it. And when they shall have finished the testimony, their testimony, the beast that descended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, shall overcome them and kill them. And then what's going to happen is, verse 8 says, their bodies lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. But it says, I want you to know what I'm talking about. It's the same city in which our Lord was crucified. See, so I'm talking about Jerusalem. And you would think that a nation seeing these wonders would get right, but they didn't. And then it says, when they, when they find their dead, look at verse 9. And they are the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three and a half days. And they're so cruel, they're not going to even bury them. And verse 10 said, they're going to rejoice, make merry, send gifts. Merry Christmas, y'all. They're going to send gifts to one another. Because the two prophets that brought all of the havoc on the earth are now dead. They're gone. Verse 11. Don't turn the channel off. It says, and after three days and a half. The spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet. If there ever was an opportunity for people to get right with God, it should be now. Because you just saw two dead people in the street stand up and validate that they were of God. And then notice, not only see them, verse 12 says, and they heard a great voice from heaven telling these two, Come on up here. And they ascended up. I think just sort of floated on up, got on up out of here. And the enemy with CNN, MSNBC, one, one Fox, uh, One News, uh, all of them watching them go up, mouth wide open. The problem is nobody's getting right. All of this, God is trying to do something. He says, and now the second war is over. You got rid of two wolves, seven trumpets, three of them bad, two of them gone. Last one. Look, if you would, in Revelation eleven fifteen. The Bible says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. As you're reading that, you're trying to see, well, where is the woe in here? Keep reading. And the four and twenty elders which fell down before God on their seats, they fell upon their faces and they worshiped God. Keep reading. Saying, we give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art, wast, and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations, this is what perplexes me, were angry. Mad with God. And I ask the question, as I often like to ask, how in the world can a human being be mad with God? And yet they are. They're so angry that they ignore him. They ignored his love when he gave his only begotten son. And now they're ignoring his wrath when he's trying to chase them in the right direction. How in the world can a people get that low? It says in the time of the dead, that's the woe the time of the dead that they should be judged. That's the woe. And I say this for anybody who is not saved this morning. You will have to stand before the almighty judge. 
Now here's the issue. On this side of the rapture, you don't have to see him as a judge who will put you in hell. On that side, if you see the judge as a judge, you're in trouble. That's the woe. All that has taken place, this is the one you don't want to take place because now there is no hiding place. I asked a few questions as I closed. Let me read these. I wrote them down. I had to think about them. A few things I wrote to myself. I thought these things out loud. I had to say them. First of all, after I read something like this, I got to stop and I got to praise him. I have to praise him with all of my soul because I now understand he's worthy. I want to praise him now and be in practice for when I get up there then. I will start doing now what you're going to do then. So you want to be praising him right now because it carries over into eternity. Do you know had it not been for the Lord, praise him for his goodness. Praise him for his mercy. Praise him for his love. Praise him for his wit, wis, uh, uh, wisdom. Praise him for his patience and long suffering with you and I. Just praise him. You have every reason in the world to praise him. Oh yeah, he fed you this morning, but he fed people that don't even praise him. Find the reasons to praise him that have to do with your relationship with him. Then secondly, I want to thank you. A little personal, I want to thank you for my salvation. I want to thank him for your salvation. I, th I want to thank him that I was saved and you were saved in due time. I want to thank him for knowing what the future holds and being willing to share it with you and I. And then application. I'm living in expectation. All of this is going to happen. Every bit of it. But there's one part that tells me I have to get out of here before it happens. So I'm living in expectation of that moment. Now hear me now. How do you want to be found when he comes? I want to reflect on my ability to endure hardship knowing that he's coming. I don't want to be so soft and so touchy so sensitive about things when I know he's coming. You know, if somebody make you mad, don't feel like you got an answer, just blow it off and just say one of these days. First of all, they might get some grace like we needed it. And secondly, in the big scheme of things, it don't really matter. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. I want to hold on to things kind of loosely while I have things you got to hold them loosely. I'm going to tell you why. No matter what you have, you got to let it go one day. So I'm influenced to think loosely. What You got a nice car? Hold it loosely. Look good while you're driving, but you can't take that thing to glory with you. And you don't want to or need to. Hold loosely. Don't, don't be so bound that God got to snatch us up by uh, roots to get us up out of here. He going to snatch us up, but don't be holding on to nothing when he do it. Just go. Go willingly. Then notice lastly. I'm influenced. See the hundred. The people next door to me think I need to be saved. So they come by to tell me. <laughs> now if they think I need to be saved. And I know they not. Somebody ought to tell them. Meaning I'm influenced more so. To be a witness. Because I know what is coming. You and I know what's coming. And we have to open up our mouths, yes. And we should so live our lives that people can believe what we say because we know what's coming. I am influenced today to live in light of all of this because I know it's coming. I want to tell my sister, sis, you need to get ready. You need to get ready. And I know you. she's still playing, bless her heart, several of them still playing with this. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. Last time we rode in the car together, catching a plane to go back east, I said, sis, I'm going to ask you something. I said, now, I'm not trying to scare you. I said, but if that plane don't make it, can I have some assurance of where you're going? And she looked at me. I said, I'm not saying I know anything. I don't. I said, but I need some assurances. 
And her words to me, well, you know, the people in China believe this. I said, I ain't talking about people in China. I'm talking about you. I ain't asking you about nobody in China. I'm talking about what do you believe? And she said, well, I'm, I'm getting close. You know, but getting close is not the same. It's not the same. And this morning, I'm burdened because that picture, that first picture where, boom, they were gone. Now, the part that got me was the, the preacher in the robe was still standing there. <laughs> Y'all see him? But I, I, I'm, I'm being honest with you. I know it's going to be that way. Because not everybody who says, Lord, Lord. Now, don't you be singing Amazing Grace and boom. And you trying to finish that chorus all by your lonesome down here. You hear what I'm saying? Don't be caught in these seats. Don't be caught at home. Don't be caught in the bed. Don't be caught in the car. Don't be caught somewhere left behind when the opportunity to be saved and go with him and avoid all of this is now. Bow your heads in prayer. Simple question. Are you ready? Are you ready? And if you are not, and you know you're not ready, you see, don't play with God. Don't, 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 sir, please don't play with God. He sees you. Ma'am, don't play with God. He's serious about what he's done for us. We need to be serious about accepting what he's done. But I'm just wondering as we tarry for a moment, each of us examining ourselves, are you ready? And then my question, if you are not, would you do me a favor? If you're not, would you stand and head towards that door to the side and let a worker show you what you got to do to get ready? Would you do that now? Don't, don't play with this, sir. Ma'am, please don't. I'm not asking you what church you belong to. You can belong to all of them and still be lost. You can be a preacher, preacher's kid, deacon, deacon's kids. You can be a mall person, still be lost. Are you ready? If he came right now, where would you go? Would you just say, I'm not sure, but I am interested? Would you at least go listen to what has to be said? Would you do that? Christians, here's for you. The scripture says, I don't want to be ashamed that is coming. Before him that is coming. Don't want to be ashamed. And this morning, is there something you would say, Lord, if you came right now, I'm busted. I'm, I'm vulnerable. And I need to get this right before you come. Would you also make some steps today and decide either at the altar or at the door someone will talk to you. Dear Lord, we want to thank you for this morning that we could look through your book and be aware of what is coming. You've told us as you told John, things that have been, things that are, and things that are yet to be. These, Lord, are things that are yet to be, and we are warned not only to, uh, to, to, to avoid them if we're lost, but, Lord, we're also glad that we've avoided them if we're saved. We are, construct, we are instructed, we are, we are directed, Lord, to be a witness about these things, and particularly about the one who said them because this is what's coming. The world is not going to get any better. It's going to get worse. Your word guarantees that. And so, Lord, move and steer us and guide us as a believer, a body of believers, that we will be about the work we should be doing, sharing the good news. We can't make anybody be saved. But, Father, it is, enc it is encumbersome upon us that we open up our mouths and tell them what you are willing to do for them. And that is before it is eternally too late. Thank you, Lord, for this service today and how the people have listened. And we trust God as we go th through this book. We're not just curious about the future. We're not trying to peep into a crystal ball to say that we know. We want to know the will of God 
for the world to come and we want to know our place in that world and we want to know our duty in the present as we await what the future holds. Bless, we pray, each and every person if there's someone still yet kind of wrestling with what the decision need to be still at that door they can ask someone to help them. I'll be here, Lord, and we'll help as best we can. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You are dismissed this morning. And again, I'll be here at the altar if you need to see.